Okay, well, uh, maybe we should get started. Um, my name's Ed Connor, and uh, I put my email address up here if people want to email me with questions or to set up an interview time. So I'm going to give two lectures about the visual system. Uh, the visual system is one of the great marvels of biological engineering, one of the few things we don't understand how it works and we can't duplicate with uh, computers uh, even though people have been trying to duplicate human vision with uh, computers for over 40 years now. Um, the best uh, that's been done uh, at this point with the uh, most advanced deep convolutional networks is to do coarse categorical labeling with some degree of accuracy for uh, a few objects in a scene. But uh, the human ability to look around a complex scene like this, understand the identity, the uh, materials, the physics, uh, the history, the value, the behavior of everything that we see just based on the way that it re reflects photons is something that uh, we have no idea how to uh, duplicate with computers. Computers can beat us at chess and Jeopardy and math and now they can beat us at Go uh, but uh, they can't see the way we do. So two, the, the visual system is maybe uh, the sensory system that's been studied the most. Two lectures is um, a relatively short amount of time to cram it into. I've tried to select down to material that makes sense for two lectures. Some of what I'll say is really just explanatory. It's not s stuff that I expect you would expect you to memorize, but things that need to be said in order to understand other things. And as we go through, I'll try to indicate what is just explanatory detail and what are things that it's actually worth knowing. So to start with explanatory detail, the anatomy of the eye. So um, I'm not gonna test anybody on the anatomy of the eye, but we've got to start uh, by talking about the eye, because this is the place where light energy is first transduced into neural signals. So the eye is a fluid-filled sphere. It has three layers, basically. The outer layer includes the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, which you can see. And the sclera continues into the cornea, which is clear, and uh, it's optically clear. It, it emits light. There's a middle layer, uh, which back here consists of the choroid, which is a capillary bed. Um, up here, the ciliary muscle, which uh, lets us change the shape of the lens so that we can focus on things that are close or focus on things that are far away. And the iris, uh, which of course is the colored part of the eye, which can change the size of the pupil depending on light conditions, so that if it's very bright, you can cut down on uh, the number of photons that are getting in. Then the inner layer is uh, the retina uh, in here. And the retina transduces light energy into neural signals. It processes those neural signals to some extent. And it gives rise ultimately to the optic nerve, which is how light information gets out to the rest of the brain. Again, um, this isn't uh, something that uh, you would want to try to memorize, but worth mentioning that light energy is focused on the retina uh, so that there's actually a focused image here. It's focused by the cornea and the lens and changes in the shape of the lens can uh, alter the focus so that we can look at things that are closer or look at things that are further away. Many of us, myself included, uh, need correction uh, because we either have myopia, which is nearsightedness, which means that try as we may, the image is always focused in front of the retina. Some are farsighted, that's hyperopia, uh, the image is focused behind the retina. So this is a picture of the retinal surface. You can see a bunch of blood vessels. Uh, two things of note. 
this spot here is the fovea. That's uh, the center of vision. It's the part of vision where um, acuity is the highest. We have the impression as we look around the world that everything's really sharp, but in fact things are only sharp uh, for us. We only see detail uh, within a few degrees of visual angle of the center of gaze, and the way we get information about the whole room here is to use eye movements to uh, scan the fovea, which uh, gets really fine spatial detail to different points of interest. The other feature of interest here is the optic disc, which is the place where cell fibers headed into the optic nerve exit. And the optic disc has no photoreceptors. And this is just something that's sort of uh, interesting. You can, um, the optic disc obviously would be a blind spot in your receptive field. You don't usually notice it because your brain perceptually fills it in, but you can prove its existence to yourself. If you close your right, yeah, close your left eye, fixate on this X with your right eye, and then you need something bright and visible like the eraser on the end of the uh, paper to put right next to the X and then move in a horizontal line about 15 degrees away. And when you're about 15 degrees away, um, the eraser or whatever will disappear. Anybody see their blind spot? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, now we'll spend some time talking about uh, phototransduction and the retina. And this is a cross-section of the retina. Uh, the retina is actually part of the central nervous system. Uh, it's formed by an outpocketing of the neural tube during development. Um, <clears throat> so here's our cross-section. This is the inside of the eye here. This is the outside of the eye here. So light is coming in this direction. So the outermost layer is the pigment epithelium, which is important because it absorbs light, which prevents backscattering, which would add noise to your vision, so it helps you see better. <clears throat> and um, it also supports renewal of photopigments for the rods and cones, which are the uh, photosensitive cells. So it's the rods and cones that transdu transduce light energy into electrical signals. Um, so here's a blow up of a rod, here's a blow up of a cone, rod, cone, rod, here in um, uh, nearly the outermost layer of the retina. It's an odd uh, sort of arrangement that uh, light is coming in this direction, but the photoreceptors are all the way at the end of uh, the cross section of the retina. So difference between rods and cones, uh, rods are extremely sensitive to light but uh, they have relatively low spatial resolution because they contact lots of cells downstream. In contrast, cones have lower light sensitivity, but higher spatial acuity because they have a one-to-one -one relationship with downstream neurons. Also, it's cones that are responsible for color vision because there are three types of cones with three different pigments pigments that have different absorption spectra, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So rods and cones transduce light, and the next relay cell uh, type is the bipolar cells, uh, like this blue cell right here. So rods or cones synapse onto one or more bipolar cells, and the bipolar cells then synapse onto the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, so this is a retinal ganglion cell here, and it's the retinal ganglion cells that actually send their axons out through the optic nerve. <coughs> so that's the main uh, relay, rods, cones, bipolar cells, retinal ganglion cells. But then at, uh, this layer of synapses between rods, cones, and bipolar cells, uh, lateral interactions are mediated by horizontal cells that um, connect uh, to at a number of different synapses. And then at this synapse between the bipolar and the retinal ganglion cell, you've got amacrine cells. 
So there are a number of takeaways from this slide that are worth knowing. Um, uh, basically, that uh, uh, you've got phototransduction in rods and cones. Rods are more sensitive. Cones are um, more spatially acute. Rods and cones, bipolar cell, retinal ganglion cell is the basic relay, and then you've got lateral interactions being mediated by horizontal and amacrine cell, amacrine cell. So that's all worth knowing. So w another odd thing about vision, we usually think of absorption of energy from the world as producing um, action potentials or electrical spikes or at least depolarization of neurons. But in the visual system, absorption of light actually results in hyperpolarization and a decrease in transmitter release rather than an increase in transmitter release by the rods and cones. And uh, that's represented here. The resting state potential of uh, a rod or a cone is around minus 40 millivolts. And then light flashes of different intensities will produce different levels of hyperpolarization. So the signal coming out of rods and cones uh, is actually a decrease in transmitter release. This shows the cellular electrophysiology behind it. Um, it doesn't have that much that you're not familiar with. Um, everybody's familiar with the idea that you've, uh, that resting state potential is based on the balance between sodium flowing down a gradient into the cell and potassium flowing down a gradient out of the cell. And uh, with rods and cones, these uh, sodium channels are gated by cyclic GMP. And when light is absorbed, cyclic GMP is degraded. That closes the sodium channels. Um, that makes uh, the cell more hyperpolarized because um, you no longer have sodium flowing in, but you've got potassium flowing out, and that hyperpolarization decreases transmitter release, and that's the signal for light absorption. So here, I'd say the takeaway is, you know, it's, it's pretty normal cellular electrophysiology. The important thing is that these sodium channels are gated by cyclic GMP, which is degraded by light absorption. And this shows the uh, cascade of events that uh, results in that. So you've got absorption of a photon by a pigment mo molecule, um, which happens to be called rhodopsin in rods. That activates the pigment molecule so that um, <clears throat> it can stimulate hundreds of G protein molecules. Uh, and in rods, the G protein molecule is called transducin. That's not important. Um, <clears throat> The activated G protein molecule, each one activates a cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase molecule. And then each phosphodiesterase breaks down over a thousand cyclic GMP molecules to five prime GMP every second. So this is actually an amplifying cascade where the amplifying steps are that one uh, activated pigment is going to stimulate hundreds of, of uh, G protein molecules. Then you've got the connection to the phosphodiesterase, but then every phosphodiesterase is going to uh, deactivate cyclic GMP molecules at a rate of thousands of times per second. So this confers greater sensitivity to uh, very low light stimulation. So I, yeah, the takeaway from this would be that this cascade has these two steps that, that amplify the signal. So we 
I mentioned uh, before that rods are the photoreceptors that have really great sensitivity, whereas cones are the ones that have lower sensitivity but greater spatial acuity. So um, uh, in part, they're designed to handle different lighting conditions. So if we're in a really dark room or we're outside on a moonless night, um, it's only rods that are sensitive to give sensitive, sensitive enough to give us any information. And those conditions are called scotopic conditions. Whereas under normal illumina illumination conditions, um, indoor lighting like this or outdoor in the sunlight, the rod signal is completely saturated. Uh, there transmitter released by rods is shut down as far as it possibly can be and it's only the cones that are providing information. So under scotopic conditions you can't see very well, um, you've got very poor acuity and you can't see color at all because your cones aren't active. Under photopic conditions you can see with great acuity because you're using your cones and uh, you can see color because the cones provide color information. This diagram shows the distribution of rods and cones across the surface of the retina. So this represents distance from the retina, uh, distance from the fovea, I'm sorry. So the fovea is right here. The green curve represents the density of cones. So at the fovea, it's all cones and there are no rods. Uh, so Cones, very dense, sorry, at um, the fovea, and then they go way down. Rods, on the other hand, uh, none at the fovea, uh, but then they're much more present outside the fovea. And if you do a cross-section through the fovea, it looks like this. It's kind of a pit where uh, not only are the rods gone, but all the axons and blood vessels are pushed to the side to increase clarity of vision at that point in the system. You probably had the experience of being in a really dark room. You want to look at something, you can't see it, but then if you look a little bit away, you can see it. That's because you're only using your rods. You don't have any rods at the fovea, so you actually have to look to the side to bring rods to bear under purely scotopic visual conditions. Just a little bit about color vision. Um, this represents absorption spectra of pigment types across the visible wavelength range from long wavelengths around 600 in the red region to short wavelengths around 400 in the blue purple region. The dashed line shows the absorption spectrum of rhodopsin, which uh, is what rods depend on. And then these three other lines represent the three types of opsins in the different cone types. Uh, they can be referred to as long, medium, and short wavelength, sometimes referred to as red, green, and blue. Although, of course, the so-called red pigment actually peaks around chartreuse and only dips into, only uh, reacts to red light a little bit. And it's the relative activation between these cone types uh, that our sense of color is based on. For example, um, turquoise is based on relatively equal activation of uh, medium and short wavelength cones. Uh, this over here, by the way, is uh, a false color picture of cones across um, the fovea. And you can see that it's mainly long and medium, or red and green present. In fact, most of vision is based on uh, red and green cones and uh, just a few blue cones. So the important takeaway uh, from here is really uh, just that there are three uh, absorption specs spectra for the different opsins and that's the basis for color vision. So the, the next thing to talk about 
is um, center surround structure of uh, retinal ganglion cell receptive fields. So by receptive field, uh, is the concept you probably know, the receptive field of a cell is the portion of um, the receptor sheet that the cell responds to. So in vision, the receptive field is the portion of the retina, which corresponds to part of the visual field that um, a cell will respond to light energy in. And the receptive field of a rod or a cone is just going to be a spot in the visual field. And if there's light on in that spot, it's going to turn off a transmitter and that's going to produce a signal uh, for the brain. Um, and it doesn't matter what else is happening in the visual field. So things are different by the time you get uh, to retinal ganglion cells. Their receptive field structure is an antagonistic center surround structure. That is, uh, a given cell may respond to light at the center of its receptive field, but then it's actually suppressed by light, that is, it pre prefers dark, in a surrounding ring. So that would be an on-center uh, retinal ganglion cell. And in contrast, there are also off-center retinal ganglion cells that uh, respond if uh, the center of their receptive field is darker and the surround is brighter. So um, this plot here just demonstrates that. Uh, so here's the stimulus conditions up here. And here we've got uh, a diagram of an on-center ganglion cell and an off-center ganglion cell. If we start with a gray background and then we shine a small spot of light here, that's going to turn on the on-center cell. It's not going to do anything for the off-center cell. If we take that light off, then we're going from bright to dark here, and the dark change in the center is actually going to turn on the off-center cell because these cells are sensitive to temporal history as well as contrast uh, with uh, the rest of the world. On the other hand, if we start with a uniform background and we make the center darker, uh, we're going to get a response from the off-center cell. Go back to uniform, now we've made the center brighter and we're going to get a response from the on-center cell. And this shows the antagonism between center and surround. So you can turn a spot of light on here, get a strong response from an on-center cell, but now if you add light in its surround, you turn the on-center on off. So the reason that we have on and off center retinal ganglion cells is we've got on and off center bipolar cells. So the uh, on or off nature of the retinal ganglion cell depends on which kind of bipolar cell it talks to. And what makes a bipolar cell on or off center is the type of receptor the type of glutamate receptor it has, um, and on center cells are basically activated uh, by um, when uh, there's less glutamate. Off center cells are activated when there's more glutamate. So they either uh, turn the signal from the rod or cone into uh, a positive signal or a negative signal. Um, so there's a lot of detail here. The important thing uh, from this is just to know that it's the bipolar cell and its receptor type that uh, changes whether there's a positive response to light uh, that's going to activate a retinal ganglion cell or a negative response to light. So then how do you get the surround structure? Well that's conferred by the uh, horizontal cells. Um, and the example here is for an own center retinal ganglion cell uh, that uh, responds positively to light here. If this is dark, um, these cells are active and those cells inhibit transmitter release here. But remember, inhibiting transmitter release actually increases the cell. So everything's tending um, uh, to decreasing in this situation where you've got bright center, dark surround, everything is tending to decrease transmitter release, which is going to turn on uh, an on-center bipolar cell. But now if you add light here, 
um, you're going to turn off this cell. It's not going to inhibit release anymore. That's going to re re result in more transmitter. Um, and that's going to tend to turn off the bipolar cell. Um, so that's a little bit complicated. The important thing really is just to know that uh, you've got horizontal cells that connect surround photoreceptor signals with center uh, photoreceptor signals and they modulate those signals by affecting the release of, syna uh, of transmitter from this synapse between the photoreceptor cell and the bipolar cell. So why does the retina have uh, center surround cells? When in fact, well in fact this is a really important information compression step for the visual system because we live in a world in which many parts of uh, the visual field have relatively uniform illumination, uh, like big areas of white or gray or black. Those areas don't carry much information for us. It's basically a redundant signal being carried by thousands and thousands of photoreceptors. So you don't want to waste the brain's computational power on just reprocessing the fact that this is gray, 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 gray. The important information in our world is at the edges where uh, there's a contrast between a lighter luminance or a darker luminance, or between one color and another color. And the center surround structure of retinal ganglion cells ensures that they don't respond to uniform stimulation. They only respond at contrast borders like this. That's because in situations where everything is darker or in situations where everything is lighter, there's a pretty good balance between the activation of the center part of the receptive field and the inhibition of the surround part of the receptive field. So everything stays around negative 40 and there's no change in transmitter release. And you only get a cha change in transmitter release when the retinal ganglion cell is um, at a point in the world where luminance is changing. Uh, for example, here, where you're stimulating the surround more than the center, and you'll get a, a decrease in response rate. Or in this case, where because uh, the receptive field is really right on the edge, you've got a balance that favors the positive center, and now you get a big increase in uh, response rate in the number of action potentials fired by the cell. And that's a major information compress compression step for the visual system right at the beginning of processing in the eye. Question? E is higher than A. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, it's only a diagram. Uh, I assume it's taken from experiments, and it has to do with the uh, exact balance uh, uh, of between the parts of the receptive field under different luminance conditions. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. But. Okay, so we've been talking about the retina, and again, retinal ganglion cells send their axons out through the optic nerve. You get to the optic chiasm here. That's a point at which some of the axons cross to the other side. The nasal part of the retina, the part that's closer to your nose, the axons from that half of the visual field cross to the other side. The result is, uh, because of the optics of the eye, that all the information from the left half of the visual field, from both eyes, goes to the right half of the brain. And all the information from the right half of the visual field goes to the left half of the brain. So, 
past the optic chiasm, these retinal ganglion cell axons continue through the optic tracts and they synapse uh, mainly in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the main relay nucleus for, for vision. The lateral geniculate nucleus has six uh, very distinct visible layers, three of which receive input from the opposite side eye and three from the same side eye. So information from the two eyes is still separate at this point into separate layers in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And the layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus are also divided up into four parvocellular small cell layers and two magnocellular or large cell layers. The parvo layers receive inputs from so-called P retinal ganglion cells and the magno layers receive from M retinal ganglion cells. So what's the difference between them? P retinal ganglion cells have small dendritic arbors, uh, so they're talking to small numbers of bipolar cells, so they have smaller receptive fields, so they uh, provide visual information with greater spatial acuity. Uh, they're responsible for vision of fine image details. It's also the P retinal ganglion cells that are sensitive to red-green wavelength differences. So they're important for color information. In contrast, the M retinal ganglion cells have uh, very large dendritic arbors. They're getting information from lots of bipolar cells. That makes them more sensitive under low light conditions, but also decreases their spatial acuity. So they uh, are not useful in trying to see really fine detail. Also, the M retinal ganglion cells are not sensitive to wavelength differences. And finally, uh, M retinal ganglion cells have more transient responses. They're more responsive to changes in illumination. Then finally, there are these K retinal ganglion cells, uh, which don't synapse in the parvo or the magno layers of the geniculate. They synapse in these thin layers in between the coniocellular layers. And the K retinal ganglion cells convey blue-yellow color differences. So, a little bit of detail to that, but uh, one of the, the real themes in uh, the earl this early vision lecture is how different types of information are channeled through different types of bipolar cells, different types of retinal ganglion cells, different layers of um, the lateral geniculate nucleus. So it's, it's worth knowing a little detail on those. So <clears throat> Neurons from the lateral geniculate nucleus project to primary visual cortex in the back of the brain via the optic radiations. Um, and the segregation between information from the two eyes, uh, which is maintained in the lateral geniculate, is also maintained at least in the input layers of um, primary visual cortex or uh, what's called V1. And you can do different kinds of experiments that let you demonstrate that uh, there are these stripes that are sensitive to uh, the opposite eye and in interleaved stripes that are sensitive to um, the ipsilateral eye. So another thing uh, it, that's important to know about primary visual cortex is just like the retina, just like the lateral geniculate, things are spread out into an orderly map of the retina, an orderly map of uh, the visual field. And this is true not only of V1, but a number of higher level visual areas that V1 projects to. 
So if you map out the contralateral visual field like this, if you're looking at V1 in the right hemisphere, we know that the right hemisphere processes information about the left half of visual space. So if we use these color codes to represent, uh, darker is representing the fovea, um, and here's parafovial, and here's the periphery. Upper field is represented in green, lower field is represented in purple. This is how that map would look spread out across the surface of primary visual cortex. With uh, the fovea represented, again, this is the medial wall of the right hemisphere. This is the very back of the brain, the occipital pole. The fovea is represented right at the occipital pole. Upper field down here. Um, below this sulcus, which, which happens to be called the calcarine sulcus. Lower field represented up here. You've got an expanded representation of the fovea because this is where you've got uh, the most cones and rods. This is where uh, you've got the highest acuity spatial information. Here's the parafovial map. Here's the peripheral map. Okay, so I mentioned pathways, and this is a pretty complicated diagram uh, for which you don't need to know all the details. But, but you should know that uh, different types of information are routed through different structures, uh, not only in lateral geniculate nucleus, but in uh, different layers in primary visual cortex and in uh, different stripes in the next part of visual cortex, which is called V2. So you can basically think about three pathways carrying different types of information. A motion pathway uh, that carries information about how things are changing through time. A form or shape pathway that carries fine spatial detail that lets you recognize things in a very acute manner like distinguishing uh, different people's faces. And a color pathway uh, that carries uh, color information. So the motion pathway largely arises from the change sensitive magnocellular pathway in the lateral geniculate. It projects to a particular layer in V1 called uh, 4C alpha. Don't worry about that. The important takeaway about um, these layers in V1 is that V1 um, layer 4 is very substratified. So for most of cortex, V4 is the input layer. If you've got ascending inputs from the geniculate or ascending inputs from lower cortical areas, they're going to synapse in layer 4, and then information will go into layers above and below layer 4. So because of the channeling of information in, in V1, you've got this uh, unusual substratification of layers. And motion information goes through layer C, 4C alpha and then through layer 4B and then out. And uh, that motion information partly goes out directly from 4B to this area that's called MT. Uh, MT stands for middle temporal. It's a um, completely separate visual area with a separate map a visual space in which most of the cells are processing information about motion, about the direction of motion, about the speed of motion, and about where things are in space. <clears throat> so the other place that layer 4B projects motion information to is the so-called thick stripes in V2. So if you stain V1 and V2 for cytochrome oxidase, which is a um, metabolic enzyme uh, for, it's a metabolic enzyme. The pattern that you see in V1 is a pattern of blobs. It looks like uh, a bunch of leopard spots. And the pattern that you see in V2 is stripes, uh, an alternating series of thicker stripes and thinner stripes. <clears throat> and it's the thick stripes in V2 that get motion information from this particular layer in V1.
So that's the motion pathway. Magnocellular pathway to specific layers in uh, sublayers in layer 4v1 and from there to V2 thick stripes and even directly into MT. And the V2 thick stripes also project to MT. So there's a direct projection and there's this indirect projection via the V2 thick stripes. So then the form pathway, the high resolution spatial information pathway, mainly derives from parvocellular layers in the lateral geniculate, which projects to a different sublayer in V1 layer 4, 4C uh, beta. 4C beta cells project up to layer 2, 3 cells in V1, and those cells project to the inner stripe region or the pale stripe regions in V2. So the form pathway is parvocellular, specific sublayer in V1 layer 4 to the pale or interstripe regions of V2. And then finally, the color pathway uh, depends partly on wavelength sensitive cells in uh, parvocellular layers, part, uh, and they're sensitive to red green information, partly on blue yellow information from the coniocellular layers. also projects to layer 4C beta um, in layer 4. And then, uh, according to at least some studies, projects to the cytochrome oxidase blobs, which in turn project to the thin dark stripes in V2. So color channel, parvocellular, coniocellular, specific layer in layer 4, blobs, thin stripes in V2. So after that, V1 and V2 project to a diverse, densely interconnected hierarchy of visual processing areas uh, that can largely be divided into a ventral pathway and a dorsal pathway. The ventral pathway is headed in this direction, down into the inferior parts of occipital and temporal cortex. It's also called the what pathway because it processes information about what is in the world, uh, like what object you're looking at. It's responsible for fine form vision, color, texture, recognition of objects, appreciation of object structure. And then there's the dorsal pathway, which is headed up towards parietal cortex near the top of the brain, so MT is one of the first stations in the dorsal pathway. The dorsal pathway is also called the wear pathway because it processes information about large-scale space, where things are in large-scale space, how things are moving in large-scale space, and how we, the observers, are moving through large-scale space. And that's where I'm going to end today. Uh, the next lecture is about uh, the processing in these areas beyond V1 and V2 and how it generates information about the world. And that's where the really mysterious, amazing things in the visual system occur. <laughs>